uh, webinar present. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of uh, Director uh, Donald Spiegelman, who could not be here today. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about READY uh, just before I introduce Dr. Cass. Leveraging the expertise of Yale Center for Methods and Implementation and Prevention Science and the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS, READY, which stands for the Rigorous, Rapid, and Relevant Evidence Adaptation and Implementation to end in the HIV Epidemic Implementation Science Hub. So you see why we say READY, it's much easier to say. Uh, READY provides technical assistance to 10 ending the HIV epidemic projects in New York, New Jersey, Alabama, California, Florida, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Illinois, and Texas. READY does this in collaboration with the Implementation Science Collaboration, uh, Coordination, and Consultation Initiative, pronounced ISCI, by creating opportunities to translate local knowledge into generalizable knowledge whenever possible. READY offers comprehensive expertise in implementation science methods, frameworks, strategies, measures and outcomes in HIV AIDS research, design and management of experimental and observational implementation science studies, data collection and sampling, quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods analytic approaches, partnership formation, community-based participatory research, and as you'll see today, public health ethics. If any of you here today would like to know about future Ready webinar events, please notify William Tootle in the chat and he'll be happy to add you to the email list for Ready. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to you, our speaker today, Dr. Nancy Cass. Dr. Cass is Vice Provost for Graduate and Professional Education at Johns Hopkins University and the Phoebe R. Berman Professor of Bioethics and Public Health at the John Hopkins University Berman Institute of Bioethics and Bloomberg School of Public Health and Professor of Health Policy and Management. In 2009 to 2010, Dr. Cass was based in Geneva, Switzerland, working with the World Health Organization. Dr. Cass received her BA from Stanford University, completed doctoral training in health policy from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and postdoctoral training at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at George Washington University. As Vice Provost, Dr. Cass focuses on the quality of PhD education and postdoctoral training, including promoting transparency about programs, diversity of the student body, professional development, and mentoring. In her faculty role, Dr. Cass conducts empirical work in bioethics, public health, and human research with publications on global and US research ethics, public health ethics, and the learning healthcare system. Dr. Cass chairs the NIH All of Us Research Program, Central IRB. She previously served as consultant to the President's Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments, the National Bioethics Advisory Commission, and the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Cass is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine, and an elected fellow of the Hastings Center. Uh, now, those of you who responded, who registered, know that you can find this, uh, uh, what I just read online, but uh, I could not resist the opportunity to read it aloud because I'm so excited to have Dr. Cass with us today. And so I will turn it over to you, Dr. Cass, and we look forward to your presentation on ethics and implementation science. Thank you. Um, it is great to be here and nice to see, I've already had a little private chat hellos with a few of my old buddies and um, thank you for thank you for inviting me and, and I look forward to some comments and conversation at the end. So I am going to um, jump right in and share my screen. Um, are you seeing the one big screen? Yes. That's perfect. Okay. So um, you'll see as I go on that my thinking about the issues that I'm going to discuss today, in my mind, are relevant to a few pieces of overlapping work, what I will call work where we're trying to learn more, that certainly is often called implementation science, is sometimes called learning healthcare, is sometimes called pragmatic uh, research. And I don't mean to suggest that these are all the same thing. What I do mean to suggest is that all of them in one way or another are trying to learn more about things we do in the real world, 
or things that we should be doing in the real world. And there is a concrete, hopefully rigorous way of doing that learning. And we're trying to learn about something, not simply in a real world setting, but often using interventions that we don't think of as experimental. And that body of work, those characteristics, in my mind, define a lot of these words that are on this very busy title slide um, and shape the kind of thinking that I'm going to present to you. So, oops, sorry. Okay. So, so what I'm going to do just to sort of get us on the same page is I'm going to spend a very brief amount of time at the beginning reminding us why we have the ethical oversight we have. And I am confident without knowing all of you that this is gonna be review. But in my mind, it's actually relevant to be reminded about why we got the IRB system and oversight system that we have and what it was trying to be reactive to. Because in my mind, it um, not surprisingly shaped the way our oversight system is structured. I'll then move on to what are some of the maybe unintended consequences when we get to newer kinds of structured learning research um, that is being conducted. And then what kinds of ethics questions do, does that kind of learning sometimes precipitate and then how might we think about those? So again, at risk of, of, of repetition for all of you, bear with me. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, there were many research scandals that became much more um, uh, public, were brought to the attention of the public and brought to the attention of Congress. One of which, um, the most probably egregious and important of which was the Tuskegee, what is it often shorthanded to be the Tuskegee syphilis study. Remember that at that time in the 60s and 70s, when a whole series of studies, which by the way, shared having either been funded by the US government or actually like the Tuskegee study conducted by our federal government on its people. At that time, there were no widespread federal regulations that provided any oversight to all of us who were researchers who got federal money about the ethics side, the rules, by which we needed to conduct our research in terms of protecting anybody's rights, telling them what we were doing, asking them if they wanted to be part of it, et cetera. So fast forward, 1974, we got a bunch of federal regulations. And if you think of this context, where again, Tuskegee is the most egregious, but there were, there were several um, studies that shared the characteristics of researchers having gone to a fairly vulnerable population who maybe wasn't going to ask questions, did things that were interesting for the scientists, not in the best interest of the participants, and wanted to learn from and on these people, so to speak. The assumption that, that was behind the people who were drafting these regulations that said, well, wait a second, we can't make that happen were several fold, I've listed three of them here. One is research is often testing experimental things and approaches for the sake of science. That's not a bad thing, but that was the paradigm that they were under. Research, if we're not careful, can be at risk because of the excitement of all of us in the research world of compromising patients or participants' best interests for the sake of science. And yes, there are, of course, these examples where that has happened and continues to happen if we're not careful. And then thirdly, research often exposes people to more risks, more burdens, and fewer choices about their what's going on with them than happens in usual care. There's a paradigm, which again, I'm not saying is wrong, but there was a certain paradigm in mind of sort of the structured research where stuff happens to you, you're in a controlled environment, um, scientists want to learn sort of for their sake and all of our sake. Um, and therefore, we better tell you what's going on and have somebody make sure, sort of do a look-see that it's all okay. So this, many things came out of that regulations, but the one that we know the best and will be primarily what I keep referring to here is that we have a set of regulations that require a few things. One is IRB review. And most projects that involve human beings need to go to an IRB 
at Yale, at Johns Hopkins, at wherever. And many of these projects, not all, require informed consent from the human beings involved to make sure that they think, so the IRB in general has to make sure that the risks and benefits of the project overall seem reasonable. And then the individual has to say, well, you guys might think in general that's reasonable, but for me, that's not reasonable. I'm not personally willing to do that. So I would argue warts and all, to be clear, whole other conversation about the warts of the IRB system. And I say that having been on a bunch of them my whole career, um, I think in a lot of ways, it's an amazing system. It, it's happening. Researchers these days who go through any kind of real research training know that they're going to need to put their stuff through an IRB. I have a colleague who says um, it's a little like the metal detector at the airport. It's not clear whether it's doing a big value in and of itself, but the fact that people know that they're going to have to go through it before they get to the other side means they're going to be thoughtful. And I actually think that one of the things that's most useful about an IRB system, and it still happens to me every time I have to put a protocol through my own IRB, is that I have to stop and think. I have to articulate a ton of details that I might not have already put into my protocol. And I have to really think about what are the risks? What will I do about them? Can I minimize them before I start? What do I have to tell people? Who do I need to have in the loop? It is also obviously a very burdensome, high resource intensity, um, system. So we want for any high burden system to be thoughtful about triage. We want to think about what are the really high risk things that need to go to a full committee and get their uh, focused attention and what are the things that are lower risk and how do we define that that maybe can be triaged in a different way. The IRB system in my mind, this is just my opinion, but I don't think it's rocket science, assumes that protections are almost always needed when we learn about something health related and involve people. And this is of course, you know, foreshadowing where we're gonna go with some kinds of implementation science or pragmatic trials or learning healthcare. Um, as I said a minute ago, there are distinctions in the regs. We all know there's this minimal risk, greater than minimal risk, which is really important and thank goodness it's there. I do a lot of research where I do surveys and focus groups with people on subjects that are not that controversial. I'm really glad that there's a mechanism for that. Um, but one might argue as we get into more and more kinds of learning in real world settings that we would maybe benefit from having a few more layers or a few more categories that help put our research into buckets that require different kinds of review based on what's going on in areas that I'll get to in a minute. And then finally, and this is again, just an editorial comment, and it's not gonna be the focus here, but I feel a need to say it, that there is not a tension in all of the discussions of the regs and their founding documents about the risks that we all face from a public health perspective, as a prospective patient of everything we don't study and don't know about. There's a little bit of an assumption in the early paradigms that research is where there's uncertainty and we don't know, and then when we learn things, they become regular care. And there's something built in there that like, therefore in regular care, we already know that everything we're doing works. And my goodness, that is not true. Okay, so the focus in the 70s was not on learning more about ongoing care. It wasn't going in and saying, wow, we've done back surgery on all these people. Is it working? Is it not working? Um, so it was less about studying or comparing what we do all the time to see what works or if one approach to that back pain or to depression or to my headache or something else works better than something else. Um, and not focused on how best to implement what we learn from sort of an efficacy perspective works, but that people aren't doing. So here are again some like claims I want to make. Um, understanding better what we already do to millions and millions and millions of people. Like, for example, do these things we do all the time really work? Are important health and policy questions? I hope that's not a controversial claim. Studying them can sometimes raise important ethics questions. The usual IRB system is not exactly equipped for them. I don't mean to say that it's useless. I really don't at all. I think some of the overall structure of thinking about what are the risks, what are the benefits, do we, have to give, do we have to do consent? Why? All that, of course, those are relevant. But I don't think that, again, what I'm going to keep calling the paradigm is had this in mind, and I don't think it's exactly, I think there might be some other checkbox screening questions that we would add if we had this in mind, and I'll get to that by the end of the talk. 
Um, and then the last thing is more what I'm going to call a sociological comment. And again, from having served on a ton of IRBs, and as you heard in the introduction, I chair a central IRB right now. When IRBs face new things, when they face things that they aren't used to seeing, they worry. They worry because they take their responsibility about protecting participants really seriously, which is a good thing. But when they worry, they take a really long time and they deliberate and they do their best without that clear guidance. And then they are particularly inconsistent. So the kinds of things we're gonna be talking about, obviously you guys do implementation science, this is your world, studying how best to roll out an intervention that sort of quote unquote works from an efficacy perspective, but it's not clear if a particular way of rolling out um, will work. So what are, the, what are the risks of that? And again, the, the question is not what are the risks of the intervention per se? Maybe it's what's the risk of, what is the risk of the rollout? What's the risk of, talking about this and maybe there's an opportunity cost that we're no longer talking about something else. Maybe it's the time, maybe it's the way it's being rolled out. Maybe it's exposing that someone has something stigmatizing that now there's a higher risk that people in their social world will know. So what is it about the rollout that could create risk? Not the intervention per se, but the rollout, the piece that you're learning about. Who, if anyone, needs to provide consent and why and for what? And a reminder here, and this comes up in different contexts, but I do think it's really important to separate. It's important if we are going to involve other people in a conversation to be able to say, here's the stuff that is not experimental. Here's the stuff that's new. And we're asking a question, does this thing work? And, and, and being clear about separating that. Um, is consent required when what I will call frame here is nudging to best practice. When they're, you're nudging in a physician reminder computer system to check for uh, medication contraindications with each other or pop-up reminders. Um, and then sort of who is being impacted? Is it the physician is being impacted? Is the patient whose care is sort of the trickle down from that reminder being impacted? Who needs to know? Who needs to give consent? Maybe neither of those parties needs to give consent, but the president of the hospital needs to give consent. So how do we, how do we think about that? And then this sort of like $10,000 question, what if these activities that we're trying to learn about are randomized? What if some of the hospital units get the pop-up reminders and some of them don't? So I wanna talk briefly about ethics and randomization. We can come back to it, but there is a reasonable amount of literature where people just assume that if randomization is part of the way we're learning whether something works, or if one thing works better than another, that it de facto always requires consent. And don't get me wrong, I actually think there will be a lot of circumstances in which randomization ought to be accompanied by consent. But I will sort of put my cards on the table um, and I'm not the only one. There is, as I wrote here on the slide, literature that dates back to the 1990s that says that there are some circumstances that, of course, have to be very well delineated that might argue for why randomization might not always require consent. The questions that I want to keep pushing us to think about, and again, I'm going to get to a little more detail on this, is given that the fundamentals in research ethics, I for sure stand by, and I'm gonna make the assumption that all of you do too, that we never want as we are learning to importantly and significantly compromise the welfare, welfare or the rights of the individuals with whom we are interacting or who are affected by the program we're rolling out in the service of science. Like let's say, of course, and then foreshadowing, we need to start asking the question, to what degree does adding a learning component to something that is being done increase the risk or threaten the welfare or rights compared to if that individual were getting their care or accessing the public health program or whatever it is, if that learning were not in place? And in my mind, that's a really important question to ask framed as such rather than getting back to, well, what's the risk of this vaccine? It's like, no, 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 we know the vaccine 
has been FDA approved, it's efficacious. The question here is whether this kind of health education, this kind of rollout that da -da, works or doesn't work, that's the learning for this particular project. We wanna make sure that people do not inadvertently take on risks that they would have avoided because they don't really know what's going on. And again, we care always about ethics. I'm taking that as a given. This talk is not like a trade-off between ethics and science. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm never gonna be coming from there. I really am a believer that it is really possible to do both, but sometimes it takes time and care, but we have to be asking the right ethics questions for that activity. Um, okay, so so I also, I, I have this, um, I think last slide on randomization about cluster randomized trials. And again, some of you I know are aware there's a big literature on cluster randomization. I don't think that um, there's consensus even in the literature about how, for example, consent needs to be handled in cluster randomized trials. Um, I am, I am throwing up here a couple of examples in, again, this sort of space of real world uh, learning and real world data collection. For example, everyone is getting something widely used in the real world, but there's lots of different approaches. The research is the randomization, right? Again, like we're all living in the same world right now. Like even imagine something about um, trying to get uptake of a COVID vaccine in populations that have um, been concerned about the COVID vaccine. And maybe there's a cluster randomization that there's one approach that's used in one community and another approach that's used in another community. And they're both examples of widely used approaches across the country in communities that have not had a lot of uptake. Um, but we wanna systematically figure out is one better than the other. So everyone is getting something that's being used. It's not thought of as sort of experimental, but there is more structure and rigor to the fact that six of these communities get approach A and six of the communities get approach B. The COVID vaccine is not experimental. So how do we think about that kind of project a real world, but smarter, more rigorous learning than just like letting the chips fall where they are and trying to piece together afterwards those communities were sort of different. Can we really believe if that one there was more uptake that it was that it was better, et cetera? Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of other. Um, uh, whoops, sorry, sorry. Um, a lot of other uh, uh, cluster randomized trials that are um, <laughs> comparing evidence-based practice to standard practice when standard practice is not consistent with evidence-based best practice. And that's a really complicated thing ethically because often in IRBs we say, well, we need to make sure that the participants are getting best practice. It's like, well, nobody's getting best practice or very few people are getting best practice. And how are we supposed to think about the ethics there? It's sort of some ethics somersaults, but they're really important questions. So if evidence suggests that one approach is better, but it's not widely implemented, is it ethically acceptable to randomize populations where there's a lot more push in one of them to get the better thing and in the other group to leave things the way they were, not because there wasn't financial or geographic access, but because perhaps the providers in that community were continuing to do things that was not evidence-based. It's, it's what one article describes as the distinction between um, standard of care de facto, what's really happening, and standard of care du jour, what sort of best practice policy would have articulated. Um, so I also want to put up here that even though we tend to think about and the regs themselves really only address, remember 1970s, the regs only address individual informed consent. Assuming someone is an adult and competent, the regs only address individual informed consent. In real life, we know that there are other individuals or groups or gatekeepers or stakeholders who may be really important voices in first of all, determining whether a particular learning activity should go forward in helping to identify what are the concerning or risky or dicey aspects that a researcher or an outsider might not know about or think about. Um, and a thoughtful researcher who's not simply thinking about the regs, but is thinking about these core foundational commitments that undergird the regs, like, I care about the welfare of the people involved. Of course I do. 
I care about them not feeling exploited or taken advantage of. I care about making sure that my program, which I think is really great and cool, isn't somehow going to inadvertently in an unintended way deprive them or create an opportunity cost for something else that maybe is even a little bit more important for them. So thinking about who else needs to be part of a conversation, not to mention in a more gatekeeper sense, give permission, is a responsibility we have as researchers, particularly since IRBs don't um, th there are a lot of IRBs that have gotten into the practice of asking these questions because they live in the real world too and they're comprised of researchers, but the regs don't require them to. And it does create additional responsibilities on us as researchers. So I'm gonna transition now to present some work that I did with an absolutely wonderful dear group of colleagues who are on this slide, Ruth Faden, Tom Beecham, special shout out for Tom Beecham who um, you may not all know, was one of the two drafters of the Belmont Report. So he goes back to the regs we have, and again, the Belmont Report Ethical Foundation. Uh, Sean Tunis, who does comparative effectiveness, Peter Pronovost, who used to be at Hopkins and was sort of our guru of um, uh, quality of care and quality studies and patient safety, which of course is another real gray area in the real world where you wanna learn in a rigorous way and Steve Goodman, who's a, a clinical trials um, uh, specialist, and Ruth Faden, my dear, wonderful bioethics colleague at Hopkins is another ethics person. So we got an NIH grant um, several years ago where we said when we wrote the grant that we wanted to look at this sort of gray area between sort of experimental work and, and um, real world uh, work. And I think when we wrote it, in certain ways, I, I feel so fortunate we got funded funding because we had no idea how much we were going to discover and learn ourselves when we started to peel back the layers of the onion. But we ended up by the end of the project really um, wanting to think about and we ended up articulating an ethical framework for what for a learning healthcare system, which obviously was not um, learning healthcare system was not our language. Um, the then Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine, um, has some really um, superb reports on learning healthcare and what it is and why it's important, et cetera. Um, but the point is, it's another space where learning is happening, we hope, in a rigorous way in the context of real care, sometimes with uh, protocols that randomize people, sometimes observing simply what's already going on, sometimes trying new things, sometimes pop-ups, I mean, just a range of work. So the goal of the work that we did, which was articulating an ethics framework for this kind of activity, was twofold, which again, I sort of almost feel silly, like putting it in black and white because they feel so obvious, but here they are. One is to increase the likelihood that the continuing, continuous learning occurs. Learning is a good, learning is an ethical good. Any of us, like if I'm gonna become a patient five years from now, I wanna go into a system that is less likely to be full of errors, more likely to know what to do, where I'm less likely to fall out of my hospital bed, where I'm most likely to get the treatment that's gonna work for me, et cetera, et cetera. Let's assume that learning is an ethical good, but that that learning will proceed in a way that is ethically acceptable, that it's not at all an either or. The participant's rights, health, and interests must be appropriately protected, both when we provide care and when we learn. So um, here are the principles of, that we articulated in this uh, framework. Um, at the bottom, I have the reference here. You'll, for anybody, if you, if anybody who actually bothers to go to the article, you will see that the article itself articulated seven principles. I have eight in here. Um, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of that. We wanted to ultimately make something a little bit more explicit. Um, but I'm going to briefly read through what all eight of these are. And I'm then gonna spend a little bit of time to close out on a few of these that I think are particularly important for this space, including for implementation science. So the first is that when we learn, when we learn in real world settings, we must have in mind and implement respect for the rights and the dignity of patients, participants, families. I'll get a little bit more to that. We must respect the clinicians we are interacting with. What does it mean to come in and say, aha, we've got a great thing to try. There's, there's relevance to the fact, not simply 
respect like, oh, it's their space and I'm coming in. That's important too, but that's not what I mean. This really has to do with the clinical judgment. There are reasons why we continue to go to clinicians and not simply computer algorithms for care. Part of it is that not everything is known. And part of it is that maybe as a variation of that, Oh, a really talented clinician has judgment where they can pull together things from lots of different pieces of their experience and lots of different components of my own social and personal context to make a recommendation. Now, in our article, we go into a lot of um, elaboration about the tension in this because there's also so much data that clinical judgment is often um, wrong for a variety of reasons. So, so this, all of these have some nuance to them, but, but, we, but we are genuine in stating this as an ethical principle. Providing each patient with optimal clinical care to the best that that's understood. In other words, we, we can't um, make somebody's health, health worse off simply because it's an important or cool research question. Um, we, we have a, a, a priori obligation to avoid imposing non-clinical risks and burdens. That can be things like a ton of extra blood draws, a ton of extra CAT scans, a ton of extra surveys. None of this means you can never do it. But the reasons why these have asterisks is that it's saying to the extent that implementation science, learning healthcare, quality improvement, any of these things does start to threaten whether the patient is getting optimal care, Maybe there's a long washout period for their depression medicine, so you're trying something else. Maybe you are asking them to do CAT scans and a lot of blood, uh, a blood work. Maybe you've decided uh, that you're not going to tell anybody what's going on. Anytime the, the answer to this is, yeah, maybe there is a little something here compared to usual care, that in our frame requires more external review and oversight doesn't mean the work can't happen, but these are the kinds of things that ought to trigger, okay, a third party like an IRB or something else should be looking at this and making sure it's okay and I've done everything I can to be, um, to be protected. Um, address unjust health inequalities. I'm not going to go into that right now. I'm happy to come back to it. It's a very important uh, piece of our framework, but it's a little less central to some of the things I want to focus on in today's talk. There are also some affirmative, um, what we will call positive obligations in our ethics lingo on healthcare providers and healthcare institutions, which is an ethical obligation to participate in continuous learning. This is not, a, we don't want this to be an additive activity. We um, believe that the best health systems are ones that have a commitment to learning alongside their commitment to giving the best quality care. And really the A plus ones are the ones that integrate those and don't just have them as separate um, uh, streams of work, which relates to this number seven, which is the one that was not as fully articulated in our original paper, but has become so important as we've had more conversations with um, ethics colleagues, health systems colleagues, et cetera, which is this affirmative duty to put in place what was learned. Right, so this is, you guys do implementation science, you're already thinking, okay, cool that we have the vaccine, cool that we have the whatever the thing is, cool we have PrEP, cool we have whatever it is, but we need to increase the chance that people do it. So now you do a really great implementation science project. You show that if you do something in a particular way, you fund it in a particular way, you have these kinds of providers be the ones to talk about it rather than those, you increase the chance that people implement it. So what happens when the implementation science project is over? So for any of these, what we, what we go on to call in number seven, accountability. What's built in that increases the chance that if the thing works, the thing might be the way it's rolled out, it will actually be, there's a commitment a priori to do that long-term. That's relevant to the ethics. That might be relevant to what you allow to be in place, the degree to which you require consent if you know that the quality of care is gonna change afterwards. And then patients and families have some affirmative obligation to participate in learning of some activities. It doesn't mean suddenly we get rid of informed consent, of course not. But the fact that, for example, quality improvement exists at all hospitals in the United States, it's required to, um, is in my mind consistent with this. So let me give a little bit more elaboration on a select um, set of these. The first is respect patients. And the operative question, the practical question from my perspective 
is how does the learning activity, let's say the particular implementation science project that someone is planning, how does that project, how will it impact patients' rights, their respectful treatment, and their dignity compared with usual care? And, and one of the points that I want to make here, and I've made it in a variety of circumstances in my work on ethics, including in public health ethics, is yes, we all value, I value rights and choice and autonomy. But rights and choice and autonomy are not monolithic. My right to certain things is much deeper and more, more profound than my right to other choices I make. And to some degree, we almost forget and ignore the number of choices that are not available to us. And yet you do interviews with people and they say, everybody should have the right to decide about what happens to them. Patients have the right to decide what happens to them. And it's like, yeah, in theory, I understand why you're saying that, but of course patients don't have the right to decide about like most things in their care. They don't have the right to decide the nursing ratio. They don't have the right to decide um, when the doctor's gonna do rounds. They don't have the right to decide often which medicine they're getting when someone says they need a blood thinner or something else. And, and I would argue not simply is it, am I saying that there's a norm that a lot of things, a lot of choices are already taken out of our hands and we don't really, they're invisible and we don't even think about that when we say all choices must be presented to patients or participants. But more, at least as importantly, the point I wanna make is that not all decisions are of equal moral relevance and not all decisions should be of equal moral relevance. And we can all think about why certain kinds of decisions might really tap into important values or life norms or conveniences. I mean, I, I often use the example in comparative effectiveness studies about, I mean, again, it feels sort of knee-jerk obvious that there's a difference between a comparative effectiveness studies of two FDA-approved, widely used blood pressure medicines that are used all over the country by doctors as a first medicine, um, and they're both taken by pill at night and you get A or you get B from a comparative effectiveness study of physical therapy versus back surgery, where the implications of physical therapy versus back surgery to different human beings are huge. So the extent of consent or involvement that we would need for those studies, I would argue, is not identical. Also, the duties of respect go beyond consent. One of the things that we have done in the, what, one of the things that happens, I would argue by our having so ingrained the regs, is that that Belmont Report principle of respect for persons has come to me, be interpreted all, to be almost synonymous with informed consent. And informed consent, of course, is a centrally important way that we demonstrate respect to people who are involved in our learning activities, but it's not the only one, and it's not the only tool in our toolbox. And respect is really important. We all care about respect. There are other tools in the toolbox, and we should remember that and think about them. How much is the system transparent about the fact that it's learning and that it's doing all kinds of learning? Does it post that publicly? Does it, is it proud of it? Does it engage patients in decision-making? Okay, let me move on just for the sake of time to, it, to one of the other obligations uh, in the framework provide each patient with optimal clinical care. So that's the de facto. Ethically, we have an obligation to do this. So now we have an implementation science project. We have a learning activity. We have a patient safety initiative, whatever it is. How will this learning activity, the implementation science project, impact the net clinical benefit to patients compared to their usual care if you weren't there? Now, it could be for some of these projects that some of you work on, it's like zero. Great, checkbox. There will be other projects where that's maybe not true. And so again, asking this question is important. In my mind, asking it in relation to the kind of care the, people, the, the um, individuals involved might have, would have received without the learning activity are the important sort of ethics um, questions for us to be asking ourselves. And if the answer is any different from, oh, it's the same, that starts to invoke more responsibility for third-party oversight and potentially for 
for consent. Um, avoid imposing non-clinical risks and burdens. Um, I, I already mentioned that a little bit. What additional burdens are in place because we're all trying to learn, because you're trying to learn? Again, do they need to come back to this site, to the clinic, to the, to the hospital, to whatever it is, um, three times as often as they used to? Do they need to do questionnaires? Do they need to get blood draws? Do they need to talk to somebody on the phone? Do they need to do mobile uh, uh, pulse surveys? Um, this, um, the, the question starts out as a yes or no, but obviously if it's a yes, it's like, okay, so let's talk about them. What are they? How burdensome are they? Are they risky as well as burdensome or are they simply burdensome? Do we do anything to reduce that burden? And then if, they're, if the answer is yes, and particularly if it's like yes with an exclamation point, then again, we need a third party to say, is, are, are these burdens okay? If they are okay, we might need to say to people, we're giving you the same care as you would have gotten otherwise, but we need to learn more about that care. So we're asking you to keep a food diary for a month, a medication diary. We're asking you to do questionnaires every month that you would not be doing in regular care. And then I think this is the last um, one of the eight principles that I wanted to highlight, which is accountability. And I mentioned this earlier, but it has become one of my soapboxes because I actually feel, and I'm a researcher, I spent 30 years being a researcher, I live in a community I love of researchers, but I feel like this is where we fall down. I feel like it's not our strength to really partner and do accountability, which is healthcare systems must fulfill their promises that learning was built into care in order to improve future care. All of our consent forms, even in traditional research says, we need to find out if this medication works. We need to find out if this medication is better than the other one. So the people with diabetes or whatever it is can get better care. It's like, yeah, that was the goal, but do we do anything to make sure that people are getting that better care? No, and to some degree it's again, because we have our buckets and our expertise, but we can partner or a system can require that. And it's really relevant to the ethics. It's really relevant to the ethics. Um, let me keep going here, which is just to underscore this idea that consent is not our only respect tool, being transparent about what we're doing, having engagement, community engagement, stakeholder engagement about thoughtfully relevant parties is a way of demonstrating respect, not to mention increasing the quality and ethical acceptability of our projects, accountability, and again, a triage process. So my closing thoughts, we need tools that work for the ethics of implementation science, pragmatic trials, ongoing learning. Um, and the tools need to always get back to our foundational grounding ethics concerns. Does the activity increase risk or burden? Does it threaten core pieces of values and autonomy? Um, is it less respectful in any way we might define it than usual care that doesn't involve that learning? Um, and then I guess, you know, my final comment is that one of the reasons why the IRB system was put in place as it was, was a recognition that all of us come up with scientific ideas and designs because we think they'll work. That's a good thing. To believe in our hypotheses is a great thing. We write our grants saying, here's all the reasons I think this is gonna work and I wanna try it. And so the fact that I might be conflicted and I already am thinking that's gonna be a really cool way to make it work is not a bad thing, but it's why we often need third party oversight. And part of my um, thinking and that of my colleagues in, in articulating these questions in the framework was to be able to help have like decision tree um, uh, triage and guides that say, if you start to answer yes to some of these questions, not a problem, but you need some people who aren't you looking at the study, looking at the project so that they can help to, um, to figure out if something else needs to be done. Okay, with that, I'm stopping sharing, turn the floor back to you guys, thank you. Awesome. Thank you for your presentation. It was very thought provoking and uh, I'm sure we'll have questions. So we have about 15 minutes that we can take questions. So let me just, so you can use your reaction button to raise your hand and I'll scan the room and see who has a question uh, or you can type it in the chat. So uh, let me ask the first question. Uh, you know, I was intrigued by your comment on autonomy, you, know, you talked about you don't have it, the right to make the decision in all cases. And so I wanna ask you to respond to a current 
case, a real life case actually, where uh, there's a, a study, it's implementing intersectional stigma reduction in healthcare facilities and intervention. Part of that intervention involves a, a simulated client, somebody who goes into the clinic, who, who plays the role of a black gay man, and then has an experience with the, the, uh, cl the staff. And then at the end of that scenario, they come out of role and they say, hey, I'm Iran. Thank you, here's what I'm doing. Now the ethics, our ethical approach to researchers was uh, that the person should be known, the clinic should know they're coming and they should know that this is the person who's doing it. Because what we just wanna know is whether or not the people can actually implement, do they know how to operationalize what they learn in the intervention? However, and, and because we thought if, you, if they're caught by surprise, they might do things and say things that put them at risk. However, the implementing agency says that's not useful to us. We don't wanna know if they just have the capacity to do these things. Can they be respectful? Can they be anti-racist? We, we, we wanna know do they actually do it in practice? And so they have a different learning uh, interest than the research, which is do they have the capacity? Do they have the competencies? Can they check the boxes? And the clinic says, no, they should, they should not be notified in advance. You should just have the simulated clients come so that we can know whether or not we're actually doing this in practice. And so they're willing to take on more risk for their own learning objectives than the research is allowing because we don't have the same learning interests as they do. So it's this interesting ethical thing because the clinic is yeah. telling us what you're doing isn't as helpful. We'd rather take on more risk to get the learning that we want. And I don't know how to respond to that, but I'd be interested yeah. to think of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a really interesting example. Thanks. It's I. Um, it's 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 essentially a, a a flavor of, if I'm understanding correctly, of deception research. And when is deception acceptable ethically? Um, and to what degree do people feel like their um, rights were disrespected by virtue of of their having been a, a simulated client. Um, I, you know, I, I, I can tell you my, my own point of view there, which is, which is consistent with a lot of the literature on deception research, which is, there's no question that we can get a certain kind of validity about what's really going on when there's deception in a way that there isn't when you say to people, hey, I'm going to send Nancy in and she doesn't really have that thing going on, but we want to see how respectful you are to Nancy because we want, we want to assess you. And like, of course, they're going to be on their best behavior with me because they know they're being judged, where if you're just a random patient, they won't. So, so of course, we can learn things when people don't know. The, 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 the sweet spot in the middle from my perspective is to the extent that um, clinics can be told that someone is coming sometime this month who is not actually a patient, but is part of a study in order to assess things. Worst case scenario for the learning, the staff have upped their game for the whole month. And you aren't accurate in what you learn, but those patients have gotten really better care. My guess is that you're gonna get something about that's, that's a little more toward accuracy. So I, I think there can be ways to um, get a little bit in the middle there. Yeah, Nancy and Laurent, this is Donna. Um, you know, I know you're calling it deception research, which is such an extreme term. Like, and I worked for over 30 years in the nurses' health study, and we routinely sent blind splits of all kinds of biomarker assays to labs to monitor their quality. And it was never called deception research. It was called routine QC. So yeah. why well, Donna, I all mean, having, of a sudden is this becoming, you know, having this kind of pejorative type of title, deception research, which is going to, you know, raise all kinds of hackles and um, make yeah. it much yeah, harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For... yeah. yeah. Look, I'll, I'll answer quickly because I see three other hands there. Yeah. Um, it's not a new word. It dates back to the 70s in psychology research. Psychology research is pretty famous for having deception research, and it's why there's such a robust uh, literature. So it's not a new idea at all. There's, there is 
I guess, obviously quite a difference between having QC quality control samples sent to a laboratory and interacting with a human being who's engaged in a trust relationship. So um, uh, anyway, happy to, happy to talk uh, more about that. But I do think that there is some helpful stuff out there about um, when, when identities are masked or the true purpose is masked. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. That was a great uh, compromise uh, offer you suggested. So let's, I would just call your names and then you can go one after the other. The first is Sten, then Kave and Natalie. I wonder, um, Nancy, if you could comment on the enhanced standard of care concept specifically for research in low resource settings. So the, the notion that in, in large scale community engaged research, uh, typically prevention research, but it could also have a therapeutic element to it. Um, we, we have an innovative approach, but, but, but common sense looks at the standard of care and says that's not ethical. The standard of care, what is available now is, is not ethical. And we've sort of evolved in places, in groups like the HPTN and others, this enhanced standard of care. But I'm, I'm always felt, I'm always feeling a little uncomfortable because enhanced standard of care is still not, <laughs> it's still not adequate. But, but if, you, if, you, if you ramp it up too far, you don't have a research study. So what are some of the guidelines you use when you're guiding people like us? Yeah, it's, you know, it's impossible. It's like my headliner, it's, a, is, it's impossible. It's, there's, it's, it's an example of, um, and we see this occasionally in the United States, but obviously much um, more consistently a challenge in low, low, low resource countries. Um, it's, it's what I and others frame is how do you do just research in, under unjust conditions? The, 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 our, our, I'll, I'll make a sort of an editorial comment and then riff a little bit on your question, Sten, that <laughs> what we're taught in research ethics is um, people need to be, it's, it's exactly what you said, people need to be given sort of the, at least the good standard, and then you come along and like nobody's getting the good standard, right? The good standard is everybody gets whatever it is, a certain kind of care, a certain kind of prenatal care, a certain kind of vaccination, a certain kind of meds. Um, and nobody's getting that. And what are you supposed to do as a researcher? I, there, 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 um, there's a great article that is pretty old. I'm happy to send to someone that um, Leah Belsky and Henry Richardson wrote, um, gosh, I want to say easily 15 years ago, that I think gives some good guidance about this. And um, it also tries to ask a few triage questions, but it has to do with sort of how what are you able to do? What are their alternatives for care? What kind of sustained relationship are you going to have with people, um, et cetera? I, um, I'm, I'm stumbling over it because I feel like these get ultimately decided upon in wildly different ways. What, what I do think is pretty much the norm is if there's a piece of a standard, this is in certain ways such a funny way to think about it ethically, but I think it's what happens. If there's a piece of the standard du jour, the standard that should be there, but it's not currently there, that's not very expensive and not very difficult, then researchers are usually asked to do it. Like a classic example in HIV re prevention research, which you know better than I, is like giving out condoms and saying to people, you should use the condoms. And that in early HIV research, where nobody was using condoms in a lot of settings, and they certainly weren't being given out at a lot of the sites, one of the sort of like easy things for the IRB and ethics folks to say was, well, everybody's going to be giving condoms in this microbicide study. The, there, there is no answer. What, one thing I will say, however, is that one of the, one of the, tensions is not only around are we going to learn anything useful if we enhance the standard artificially but also the enhancement is not necessarily sustainable so that creates its own ethics challenge um, 
So, you know, I, I think my answer is it's, it's adjudicated all over the place. And I feel like there is generally an answer that involves making things better than they were, but not turning it into a New York City clinic. And then there's just like a crazy amount of variation in judgment calls. Awesome. Thank you. Have Thank you, Nancy, for this great talk. And also, um, many of our students have benefited from your scholarly papers on ethics. I, I want to ask you questions about IRB process for um, research in sort of humanitarian emergencies, health emergencies. And how do we sort of make sure the IRB process is not so burdensome and, and long that it kind of prevents uh, researchers who wanted to conduct in these uh, sort of emergency situations? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so one of the things that I actually, for, for those of us who are at academic institutions, and we have the benefit of having our IRBs at our home institutions, like they're there for us to serve us. I'm a big believer in um, having as many pre-project conversations with IRBs as possible certainly around specific projects, but even more importantly, as you were describing, around bodies of work. And essentially to say, we predictably at Yale, we have a group of people who are interested in humanitarian work. Predictably, the next time that there's an XYZ crisis, we're gonna wanna be there within a week and doing these kinds of things. And so I, I know that I know that exactly those conversations have happened at Hopkins at the School of Public Health. And I know that a couple of my colleagues actually put together sort of sample model protocols that were typical of the kinds of things they do and got and went through a back and forth. It wasn't automatic, but a back and forth with the IRB to get those approved and then could submit a track change version for every time there was a specific situation and try to have it go through an expedited process, which was something that everybody recognized the reason for, but it was much more efficient because a lot of the basics had already been negotiated. But, but it builds on the idea of like, talk to your IRB. I mean, the IRB is basically made up of us. Yes, there are staff who are not us, but like those of us who are researchers, take turn, it's like grant reviews, like it's us and we're just wearing different hats. And I think the more there can be these conversations, whether it's around that or implementation science or anything else, um, I think it's in everybody's interest. Dr. Cass, thank you uh, for uh, taking time to talk to us today. I, I asked the construction crew to hold off until one o'clock and they started writing in at 101. So, uh, let me just thank you again on behalf of uh, Reddy and Dr. Spiegelman, who is still able to join us today. Uh, we hope you all can join us again for the next uh, event. Take care. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye.